the Paul Leslie interviews. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to welcome our special guest, author Patty Farmer. She joins us to talk about her book, The Persian Room Presents, an oral history of New York's most magical night spot. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me, Paul. It's my pleasure. Who is Patty Farmer? Well, just your average run of the mill girl, Paul, but I have the pleasure of living at the Plaza Hotel. And the Plaza turned 100 years old a few years ago in 2007, and it just sent me on a magical journey. What was it about the Persian Room that captivated your interest? Well, you know, like I just mentioned, the Plaza turned 100 years old. And to tell you the truth, I did not set out to write a book. But I love the the romance and the history of anything 100 years old and seeing the changes. So I went to the management of the Plaza Hotel and asked to see the archives. And they looked at me like I had green hair. And they said, archives? You know, what are you talking about, archives? I said, well, you're 100 years old. You know, I've been talking to people, and I keep hearing this one name, this one room that was here, the Persian room. And they said, well, we have no archives. We've had a lot of owners from Conrad Hilton to the Trumps. And, you know, everyone, when they left or when they sold, they they took what they wanted, and we have nothing here. So it, it just sent me on almost like a scavenger hunt. You know, I went to the libraries, and I put a research team together. And, and found out the facts of the Persian Room, you know, when it was opened and how it was decorated and who had decorated it. But then I wanted to, to find the heart of it. So I went to the actual performers who performed at the Persian Room, and it just sprang to life, and the end result was this book. You talked to a lot of people in this book. How did you go about tracking them down? Again, it was just piecing it together the best that we could. As I mentioned, I put together a research team. So from combing through old New York papers and from the city of New York and different reviews, I was able to put together a list of who had performed, which was a huge job in itself because the Persian Room opened in 1934 and didn't close until 1975. So I had this list together, and then I just tried to hunt them down and and presented my case, what I was doing, and said I just wanted to know more about the Persian Room. And, Paul, I can't tell you what a wonderful, generous group of performers and stars these folks were, but they were so gracious and invited me into their homes, and we sat and we talked about their time at the Persian Room from back in the 1940s all the way up until it closed. The book divides the eras of the Persian Room, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Was there an era you found the most interesting? Gosh, you know, each in their own way. I think I'm not trying to be coy, but it really was. You know, the 30s was the time when entertainment in in clubs like these was primarily dance teams and bands. So you'd have orchestras and you'd have dance teams. Uh, And then the first headliners started to appear in the 40s. And at this particular room, the Persian room, the first headliner was Hildegard. So each decade really in its own way. The 40s was entertainment really coming into its own with the headliners, the big names, the Hildegards, the Liberacis, the Marge Champions, and Celeste Holmes. And then you segued into the 50s with just a a bunch of different music. You know, every generation didn't lose what we had, but we added. And, And during the 50s, we added jazz. And we had Miles Davis showing up there and Duke Ellington right alongside, or not performing together, but in the same room as Diane Carroll and Lisa Kirk and Andy Williams. And then the 60s was a a little bit of a younger crowd. You know, you had, had Leslie Gore singing to the Persian audience and telling them that it was her party and she'd cry if she wants to. We're talking with our special guest, Patty Farmer. 
You talk to a lot of people in this book. The Persian Room presents an oral history of New York's most magical night spot. Was there a person that was the most interesting or the most entertaining to speak with? Oh, Paul, that's like asking me to pick between the kids. Uh, <laughs> it, it's hard. I can't pick one. They were also interesting individually. I will tell you that I walked away at the end having learned so much collectively from all of them. You know, I learned about a work ethic. All these folks, just by virtue of the length of time since the club closed, they're of an age. They're up there in age, and they're still working. And they've, a lot of them have been working. Andy Williams, Tony Butala from The Letterman, uh, Leslie Uggams, they've been working since they were eight and nine years old, and they're still working, and they're still working because they love it, not because they need the money or for any other reason than that's what they do, and they're, they're just going to keep doing it. One of the people you just mentioned, Tony Butala of the legendary vocal group The Letterman, what did you find his personality to be like? Oh, Tony was like many of the others, but he was just so positive and energetic. And the Letterman in, perform almost 100 concerts currently. Every year they're still doing their show, and they have sold out crowds all the time. And I think it's because of, of this upbeat attitude. As I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, Tony started performing when he was eight years old. And he hasn't slowed down. He's really speeded up. In addition to the 100 concerts a year that he does with the Letterman, he had, you know, an hour or two free time on his hands. And he has a winery, a wonderful award-winning winery in Napa. So it's that type of personality, you know, just that they're always doing and always going. And, and Tony was, was wonderful. He was so refreshing. And just ageless. You would never guess his age from the, the miles that he runs. We're talking with author Patty Farmer about her book, The Persian Room Presents, an oral history of New York's most magical night spot. In the writing of this book, did you face any obstacles? Hmm. I wouldn't say obstacles. You know, I had my challenges getting through to certain personalities. But no, actually, it, it was it was a wonderful, wonderful journey back into this magical time. I don't think it was any any bad time at all. There was maybe one or two difficult individuals that I ran into, but it was just a wonderful journey, and it took it took years. As I, I mentioned, I didn't plan on writing a book, but that's what came out of it because I had been able to to piece together this part of the plaza history that wasn't there before. In addition to the performers you mentioned, the list of artists who performed at the Persian Room, it's astounding. Frank Sinatra, Vic Damone, Ethel Merman, Tony Martin, you could go on all day. What is it about the Persian Room that made it so special? It had, had the reputation for glamour and sophistication and high standards. As one of the stars told me, they said, when you got booked to play Persian Room, you really felt good about yourself and your career. You knew that you had made it in the hardest city. You know, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And if you can be booked at the Persian Room in New York, that was the top in nightclub entertainment. It was a hard, a hard not not a hard gig to get, but it, it had uh, its standards. A lot of people, as a matter of fact, had to audition that weren't used to auditioning. For example, Michelle Lee told me she was already, for lack of a better word, a movie star. She had done Love Bug and How to Succeed in Business Without Trying on Broadway. So she was a huge, well-known commodity in acting, and yet to perform at the Persian Room, she had to audition because they wanted to make sure that her singing act was up to their standards and could carry their audience for over an hour. So it was just a high standards. Once you were there, you felt good about yourself. We're speaking with Patty Farmer, author of the book, The Persian Room Presents.
an oral history of New York's most magical night spot. Tony Butala mentions in the book that as a performer you want to dress maybe a level above the crowd. That's changed a lot. You look through the book and everyone is looking so debonair and so glamorous. You know, so much has changed in our society. You, back in the day, all those decades, right up into the 70s, you still put on tuxedos and beautiful evening gowns, and you had your hair coiffed and put on beautiful jewelry to go to a show like The Persian Room. And not only what you wore, but how you behaved, you behaved to a certain code. There was no raucous yelling from the audience and there was no yelling from the performers either. I mean, we just had our Super Bowl, and we saw what the entertainment was like there to the crowd. You, you just had a, a mutual respect. It was a different code of conduct that's not around anymore. Your times have changed. You think we can go back to that? You know, I wish I wish we could, Paul, because I I loved I loved that way of life. It was an easier more relaxed, I think, even though you, you put more effort into it in your appearance, you went in for a couple hours, you had dinner in a, a very lovely atmosphere, and you had civil conversation, and then you sat and watched a beautiful show, or a fun show, it wasn't, you know, Eartha Kitt did not put on a laid-back show, she was very hot and very sultry, and did a fabulous show, and I don't, I don't think we can. I don't think we can go back to that. Do you? Only on an individual level. That's what I think anyways. What is the best thing about being Patty Farmer? Oh, so many things. I think the job that I have as a writer just gives me a, a peek into other people's lives. And, and lets me experience what it was like in the in the 50s or the 60s, and I enjoy that immensely. Enjoy being able to take my readers back in that time with me. Do you have any parting words for our listeners? If you don't mind, Paul, maybe we could remind your audience that I'm giving a good portion of the proceeds from the book to a charity that is very near to my heart. It's called Child Help. And for over 50 years, they've been fighting the hard, hard fight for the prevention and treatment of child abuse. Thank you very much for doing this interview. Thank you for asking me, Paul.